coming soon to a pharmacy near you. Lower prescription drug prices. That's the goal, at least, as Medicare takes steps to negotiate prices, starting with 10 medications that cover a wide range of common and serious conditions, including diabetes, heart failure, and arthritis. After a lengthy negotiation process, new prices are expected to kick in in 2026. That is, if lawsuits filed by several of the drug companies behind those prescriptions don't succeed in blocking the process altogether. So, what does this mean for Medicare, its patients, and the rest of us? I'm joined now by Mike Astrew, former general counsel for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and former chair of MassBio, and by Dr. Hussein Lalani, a primary care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and health policy researcher with Harvard Medical School. So, Mike, you've actually been on every side of this issue, from pharmaceutical CEO to government. So why don't we start off with you. Is this going to affect prices for consumers at all? Yes, it's going to hurt consumers, actually, in the short run because of some of the changes they're making in Medicare Part D. Uh, the left wing of Congress has never liked the managed care elements of Medicare, and so in part of this whole package, they've stripped that out. And so um, ordinary people on Medicare will probably be paying a little bit more, and they re won't be benefiting from these price reductions because those are really to save money for the uh, – it's to punish the companies primarily, but it's also to save money from a budgetary point of view. So the average American person will not see any financial benefit from this and will also see in the, before too long – if it's successful, which I don't think it will be, because I think it's blatantly unconstitutional, I don't think it will get past the courts. But if it does, it will greatly damage the development of innovative drugs the same way 30 years ago uh, the Clinton proposals to control drugs caused a nuclear winter locally in biotech and shut down most new development for several years. Jose? I, I strongly disagree. I think we've already started to see that the Inflation Reduction Act is lowering prices uh, and costs for patients. I mean, we've capped insulin at $35 per month. Uh, patients aren't paying more than that. It's helping a lot of my patients who have diabetes. And I think, you know, these new drugs that are going to be negotiated, they're accruing savings for a lot of the other features of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the, the most notable of which goes into place in 2025, which, which caps the out-of-pocket cost uh, for the whole year for patients with Medicare at $2,000 per year. That's going to save uh, tons and tons of patients who are currently paying uh, you know, upwards of that, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, especially for expensive cancer medicines. Yeah, I, I think that that is just not going to hold up. The, um, uh, you know, there are going to be tons of patients who are benefiting from the current competition in Medicare Part D, you take that competition away on the drug side, and their drugs are going to get much more expensive. So are there going to be some patients that gain? Yes. Are there going to be patients who lose? Yes. Um, and it's going to be, I think, generally a net loss for patients. But you can't credit this act with really doing anything of substance yet. And you can't say because they've already gone ahead and capped insulin prices, which they should have done a long time ago anyway. And that market should have taken care of that. But I think there were uh, inappropriate agreements you know, made. But um, that doesn't um, support the notion that this is going to be a huge success. You take 10 of the most successful drugs um, that we have on the market now, and you punish the companies for um, having them. And it is absolutely a punitive process. There are no standards. There's no administrative appeal. There's no legal appeal. The only challenge you can make is constitutional. And it's, not, it's, it's, it's a fraud on the public to call this a negotiation process because it's not a negotiation. It's a negotiation the same way and if I snuck up on you in the GBH parking lot and put a gun to your head and said, give me your wallet or else. That, that is how GBH comes last donation Yes, me. yeah, yes. Um. Um, but the or else is basically the same thing that's happening here. HHS is going to set a price. If you don't like it as a company, you don't have the option of not taking it. You have to continue providing the drug. And if you say no, you pay a 95% tax on uh, your revenue from there, not your profits, but the revenue, which means that most of them would be running these products at a loss. And the consequence of moving so dramatically in that direction, it's going to put a freeze on the ability of small companies to attract the 
the, the uh, financing that they need to continue to develop innovative drugs. I don't see this as a punishment. I mean, this th this law allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices for drugs that have been on the market for at least nine or 13 years. Uh, this is not all new drugs at all. It's a very small sliver of old older drugs that have been on the market for a while. And what I can tell you is my patients with Medicare still can't afford their medicines. I mean, one in four Americans over the age of 65 cannot afford their medicines. And that leads them to ration their medicines or not take them at all. And, and I'll tell you about one of my patients um, who has atrial fibrillation, a really common heart condition where the heart sort of flutters instead of squeezing. Um, he, you know, that increases your risk of having blood clots. And there are two medicines on, on this list of 10, uh, Zorelto and Eliquis, uh, both of which reduce the risk of blood clots. And, and they cost him $500 a month. And he just can't afford that. And because of the rules that Medicare has in place, he, can't, he doesn't qualify for any of the other programs. Um, he can't use a copay card. He applied for a, the patient assistance program from the drug company, um, and he was denied. And he's left with the $500 bill per month. So, I mean, you can't tell me that it's not going to help him. It's absolutely going to help him. He spends $6,000 a year right now on that drug. I mean, and that'll be capped at, at $2,000, but not until 2025. But if you don't have the drug in the first place, so I, I've taken one of these drugs on, on the list of 10. Um, and there's an arbitrary element, and there's an almost equivalent drug um, that's not on this list. And one of them sells seven and a half billion, and one of them sells five and a half billion. I'm on another drug that's more recent, um, making nowhere near as much money. If this system had been in place 20 years ago, the drug that I'm on never would have been developed in the first place because they would have just given. You said, you look, know, RA is a target. You know, we're just not going to do this. And I've seen this happen. I mean, when I was at Biogen. You know, they dropped their HIV um, product in part because of the pressure to keep the prices down. Um, and it's a shame because it's a product that could have helped people probably if it had been developed on a timely basis. Later, technology was better. So when it finally did start moving along with another company, it didn't benefit anyone. But the development pro process is difficult. It's expensive, it's unpredictable, and for this structure to add additional costs and additional unpredictability to it, it is going to damage the development of new products. So if you have friends and relatives with cancer, with serious autoimmune diseases, with rare conditions, this is a real threat to you getting the medicines that you want to have. So, so Mike, I, I would push on this a little bit, right? Because yeah. the tr this is the, exactly the traditional argument that pharma has made against any type of price controls. Yes. And it has economic validity, but like, as in, I would say that a lot of the argument has been damaged by the behavior of pharmaceutical companies, right? Yeah. You mentioned yeah. insulin. Uh, maybe the most egregious is the clear, clear case of pharmaceutical companies that are paying generic competitors not to enter their markets right. in ways that probably should be illegal, but aren't. Yeah. So, if the industry chooses to act in ways that make it seem like it is, at least in some ways, predatory, doesn't that undercut the credibility of the position that, well, we need this to innovate when in, in, the innovation in insulin got done a long time ago? So, so if you know, the, the argument is the industry's done some dumb things, then I agree with that. All right? And I think there are, you know, when I uh, was chair of Mass Bio, I got my, was very unpopular because I kept saying, why are you dumping prices in Canada? You know, you're just, it's not fair. You're going to create a political controversy. If we wanted to regulate drugs by saying, you get um, the best price of any developed country, I would be for that. Um, I also think that the last three administrations have done an absolutely crummy job at the FDA on what I think is the most important thing for bringing um, cost down, which is we don't have a real biogeneric industry yet. The FDA culturally has never wanted to do this. There are uh, public citizen places are getting in the way um, to um, the kinds of things that they need to do to have a biogeneric industry. You know, it is not an accident that most of these drugs are biotech products because the small molecules, the pure chemicals, are getting generic competition when they go off patent. You're not seeing that in the same way as consistently on the biotech side. Sometimes you're seeing it. And there are some drugs that are products of the old patent system, and that's about ready to cycle out. 
that creates a problem in terms of when they could go generic. But the single best thing that you could do to bring down drug prices in this country is to make sure that the FDA got its act together and, and put in the regulatory structure and the incentives to have a real biogeneric industry. And then you'd see some serious price reductions. I mean, the main reason we have high prices in the United States is because we allow monopolies. The government grants monopolies to drug companies and allows them to set the prices. And now the government is saying, okay, we're going to control the price in a negotiation for 10 of the drugs. And, you know, the thought that we have, like, every single drug is a blockbuster or a home run is just false. In fact, less than half the drugs are home runs. In a study that we did at, at our research group, Portal, the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law at Harvard Med School, we found that of the 50 top-selling drugs in Medicare in 2020, less than half were better than things already on the market. And, you know, this, this is really important because we shouldn't be paying top dollar uh, for drugs that aren't really any better than what we already have. In fact, every other country uh, in the world assesses drugs and their value compared to other, other drugs on the market. And, and yes, let's accept it, right? Drug development is expensive. I don't think anybody's saying that. But, but it's not like the drug industry is doing it all on their own. They're absolutely not. The federal government, taxpayers, they're all contributing to this development in many ways. Preclinical development, the NIH funds nearly uh, every single drug has received some form of NIH funding in the last decade plus. Clinical trials, about a, a quarter of drugs uh, are developed with some government funding. Tax credits, the government gives tax credits, the research and development tax credit, up to 20% of R&D expenses um, in the last three years. And, and the list goes on. And so, you know, there are, it, it's not like this is being done on its own. There, there are, there's a role for government here, there's a role for the drug industry. Look, the, the assertion that the federal government is doing a huge subsidy for drug development is a myth. It's just simply not true. And it's also a myth that NIH original research uh, spawns a lot of this research, if you, uh, a lot of this development. If you look, for instance, at NIH's royalties, if they were a university, they'd be like 60th in the country. Um, and the amount that they put toward clinical trials is small. It's when it's already a home run that's coming and they want to play at the party. They are not all that significant. And if you're talking about monopolies, I mean, if you mean by patents, some monopolies are important. Patents are important. Orphan Drug Act is important. Without those things, there'd be nothing at all. Um, and there's a reason why Congress passed the Orphan Drug Act um, in the is because there were all these products that were not being developed that they wanted to see developed, and it's been enormously successful. So you can say monopoly because people don't like the sound of monopoly, but there's been nothing that's saved more lives in this country in the last 30 years than the Orphan Drug Act, and that creates seven-year monopolies to companies, and it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Well, monopolies allow drug companies to set prices, right? And so, that, and so when you talk about, you know, how, how are drug prices set, that, that's how they're set. The drug company sets the prices, and sometimes for a very long time. And there, there are abusive patents. And I think one of the drugs on the list here of 10, Enbrel, is a great example. Do you know when that drug's initial patent was approved? It was 1990. Yeah, but that problem, it was 1990. That problem's already been solved. It we, hasn't we, been solved. It has been solved. We changed the U.S. patent system to solve that problem. It's just that's a pre-existing condition. Other drugs going forward are not going to be able to do what Immunex and Amgen did with Embrel or what Amgen did with EPO. It is not possible anymore. We've moved to the European system where it's 20 years from approval, um, no extensions, that kind of thing. This makes a huge difference. And when you factor in the length of time that it takes to develop a drug, probably 13, 14 years on average, there's a going to be a very short window going forward for most companies, not only to recoup their costs for the drugs that are approved, but for all those drugs that don't make it. And if you're actually trying to do, uh, serve people um, who are not being served now, you have a lot of failures. Biogen has a lot of failures. You know, um, all the innovative companies have a lot of failures. And so you've got to pay not only for the drugs that, that win, but you've got to pay for the ones that don't win. Mike Astru, Dr. Hassan Lalani, thanks for being with us today.